Hello, everyone. Welcome to our special three part introductory learning series on early psychosis 101 basics for supporting students. We thank you for your interest in our learning session today, and we remind you that this learning series is presented to you through a partnership between the Mental Health Technology Transfer Center Network and the Psychosis Risk and Early Psychosis Program Network at Stanford. We'll get started momentarily. Just wanted to open up the room and help everyone get settled in. And a reminder to all attendees today that we are muting all attendees and the session is being recorded so that we can make it available to those who are not able to attend the live event. Again, if you just entered the room, welcome. Thank you for being here with us today for our special three-part learning series, Early Psychosis 101. We'll get started in just a minute. This is session three of the three-part series, and if you miss sessions one or two, we do have them available on our website, and we'll plug a link into the chat box so that you can access the recordings for those sessions if you miss them. If we go to the next slide, I think we're just about ready to get started. So again, welcome everyone. This is session three of our three-part introductory series on early psychosis. Today we'll focus on transition to college for youth with psychosis. And we have about 60 minutes together today and we're excited to share this space with all of you. So thank you for joining us. On the next slide, we have a few reminders. Again, participants are muted with video off. And this webinar is being recorded. We'll have session slides, the recording, and certificates of attendance sent to you within a week. We also want you to make note that we have the chat box open and available for you to share your comments throughout the session. If your comments are for everyone to see, please make sure that you check the chat box drop down menu and make sure that your chat response is going to everyone and not just the hosts and panelists. We also have the Q&A box open for any content related questions for our panelists. We're keeping track of those throughout the session so that we can respond to them at the Q&A portion of our session later today. And if you'd like to enable captions, you can do so by clicking the CC icon on the bottom of your Zoom platform screen. And just a gentle reminder that we are offering certificates of attendance, but we're not able to offer CEUs for this session. On the next slide, we just have a little bit about the MHTTC network for those of you who have not worked with us before or who are just joining this session and were not able to join the previous sessions in the series. Uh, this learning series is brought to you um, through the Mental Health Technology Transfer Center Network and the Psychosis Risk and Early Psychosis Program Network. Um, the MHTTC network is funded by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, also known as SAMHSA. And the purpose of our network is to accelerate the adoption and implementation of mental health related evidence based practices across the country. Through our school mental health initiative, we bring awareness and we disseminate information and provide technical assistance and training on the implementation of mental health services in schools and school systems. We invite you to learn more about our network by visiting mhttcnetwork.org. And just really quickly on this next slide, I have a quick disclaimer that the opinions that are expressed in today's session are the views of our speakers and they do not reflect the official position of the US Department of Health and Human Services or our funder SAMHSA. And now I'll pass it over to Dr. Stephen Adelsheim, who will provide a bit about PEPNET and a little bit about why today's topic is important and then he'll turn it over to our speakers and we'll officially get started. Welcome Dr. Adelsheim. Jessica, thank you so much. And, and before we go on, I just want to take a minute to thank you for your amazing support over these three sessions, your organizational abilities and keeping us all together and on track and sponsoring this for all of us. So I want to thank you. I want to thank Judith Doberman from our PepNet network for, for your support as well and helping us bring these important sessions to all of you. And it's thanks to all of you for being here for our third session. 
uh, as you can see on the slide, PEPNET has been involved in uh, supporting efforts around early psychosis for quite a few years now. You can see some of the work groups that we've been supporting more recently and are very excited to be able to partner on these three sessions, uh, really focusing on, on identification and support for young people in school-based settings as well. Next slide, please. So let's go to the next slide. In terms of why this work is important, you know, what, what we've seen and we've spoken about this a little bit in our previous sessions is that, you know, early psychosis efforts are really a national initiative and certainly in our state of California, a major one as well. We're seeing programs grow across the nation and we're seeing every state getting additional support for these programs because of the importance of this effort as seen by our partners on the federal level. And in addition, you know, we have a new national training and technical assistance center for early serious mental illness that's developed through SAMHSA at this point that also is taking this on in a bigger level and is available to be of support to everyone going forward as well. Next slide, please. As you see, there are now well over uh, 300 programs supporting early psychosis around the country. And we hope as you learn more about this effort, you will identify the programs near you that can be good resources and support for your efforts as you might identify young people in your school settings or community colleges or universities that might benefit from additional support if they have clinical high risk or potentially a first episode of a psychotic illness. Next slide. In addition, we also actively partner with the EpiNet National Network funded by NIMH, which is working to bring together latest research and coordination around assessment to be able to further bring support to young people around the nation and really develop the greatest expertise and in, in best treatments and support for young people with early psychosis related issues. Next slide. So today it's an honor to have our amazing speakers and we're really grateful for their willingness to join us all today. Uh, our, our first speaker again, and thank you again for being back here, Dr. Bott. Uh, Perva Bhatt, a clinical assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at Stanford in our School of Medicine. Uh, Dr. Bott will be followed by Jane Elberg, an assistant professor of clinical psychiatry at the University of Buffalo's Jacobs School of Medicine, where she also serves as the associate training director for the General Psychiatry Residency Program. Following her will be Olivia Hamra, a child and adolescent psychiatrist at MedStar Georgetown University Hospital. And then we're really pleased to have Bethany Boyk here today, a graduate from the University of Michigan Dearborn, where she received her bachelor's degree in behavioral science as well. So thank you all for your willingness to join us today to share your expertise and experience. So let me turn things over to Dr. Bott to get us started. Again, thank you. Thanks, Steve. Um, we are really excited to be talking to you all about transition to college for youth with psychosis today. And we're hoping that at the end of this talk, folks will be able to recognize psychosis as a, as a continuum of symptoms that might affect folks as they uh, go through life, um, identify different domains of functioning that are important for assessing college readiness, looking at the characteristics of colleges and universities to consider, uh, and then knowing where to access resources when we're supporting these young people at, in their transition to college. So I'm going to start out with a case, uh, the case of Ethan. So Ethan is a 17-year-old male with a history of schizophrenia. He was hospitalized one time, treated with an antipsychotic medication, and that really alleviated a lot of his symptoms. He's now receiving care in a coordinated specialty care clinic for early psychosis, similar to the ones that Steve had mentioned just recently. He also just begun his senior year of high school and he aspires to go to college. So what is psychosis? Uh, and I know that th this was covered extensively in the prior two sessions. So feel free to take a look at those slides and recordings 
Um, but this is varying degrees of disruption to a person's thoughts and perceptions that make it difficult for them to recognize what is real and what isn't. And it significantly can affect their life and make it hard to function. Currently, the DSM-5, which uh, TR, defines psychosis symptoms in these five domains, uh, including hallucinations, delusions, disorganized speech, behavior, and negative symptoms. And these symptoms can occur on a continuum. Um, on the more mild side, where there's not a lot of distress, it's a very rare occurrence, doesn't really impact someone's functioning, um, all the way up to on the full threshold psychosis symptoms, where those experiences happen very frequently and cause a lot of distress, and it really impairs somebody's ability to function. We know that coordinated specialty care is a recovery-oriented treatment program specially designed for individuals experiencing a first episode of psychosis. This is actually the gold standard of care for individuals um, experiencing psychosis symptoms, and it has shown to improve outcomes, including reducing the number of hospitalizations, improving social functioning, and increased participation in care. And CSC involves a big team of individuals supporting the individual uh, and their family. And so that can include psychiatry, psychology, family support, peer support, or individuals with lived experience, along with supported education and case management. One of the big myths that, that I think needs to be addressed is um, that some folks don't believe that people can recover, and that's just simply not true. Most people with schizophrenia are able to achieve some form of recovery. Um, and that can vary uh, in how much, and it really depends on how much impairment they're experiencing. Uh, but it is important to instill hope uh, in individuals that receive a diagnosis of psychosis, uh, that things can get better and that recovery should be expected. Some level of recovery is expected. So going back to Ethan, his psychosis symptoms were well controlled for the past six months. With IEP accommodations, he passed all of his high school classes and now he's preparing uh, for college and he's wondering about this and his parents are wondering, is he ready? And they don't know how to approach the search for colleges to ensure his continued academic success. You know, in speaking with his parents, they are worried about his future. They're not sure about how his symptoms of psychosis might impact him academically and socially as he considers college and goes to college. They really want to ensure that he will succeed academically. Um, and they're also wondering about his academic potential moving forward uh, and also want to know how do we talk to prospective colleges about his condition so that he can get the right resources. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and pass it on to Dr. Elberg. Thank you, everyone. Um, I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about how do we think about assessing college readiness um, and understanding some of the domains of transition that need to be considered when we're thinking about whether someone is ready. And if they're not ready in all these domains, how do we help them get ready for um, the transition to college? One of the tenets of coordinated specialty care, and it is a re recovery oriented uh, approach uh, for young adults with psychosis. And one of these tenets is to support the young adults' goals. And if their goal is to go to college, that's what we want to be doing. Um, so if we can switch to the next slide, we're going to go through all these domains. There are six domains of transition that we want to consider. So the first domain is the health condition, knowledge, and skills. And so we want to assess whether the young adult knows what their health condition is and what's the best way to stay, um, to stay well. So are they able to keep their own appointments? Do they know what medicine they're on? Do they know how to refill their medicine? Are they aware of... Um, you know, what kind of sleep schedule they should stay on, how to stay well and maintain that wellness as they transition to college. Next slide. Um, the second domain is uh, self-advocacy knowledge and skills. Does the young adult know how to advocate for themselves? Do they participate in IEP meetings? If they have IEP meetings, do they know how to access or think about um, support services on college campuses that they might need to utilize when they do transition, um, where are they at with regards to being able to advocate. Next slide. Um, we also have to think about 
where is that young adult with regards to their independent life skills? So do they cook for themselves? Do they know how to make simple meals? Are they able to budget? Do they do their own laundry? Do What about their own hygiene? Are they keeping up with their own hygiene? And so these are all um, skills that any young adult transitioning to college or beyond might need to consider. Uh, but these might be even more challenging for young adults as they're recovering from psychosis. Um, thinking about their academic skills and executive functioning, like are they functioning independently? Do mom and dad check the portal to make sure they're uh, getting all their work done? Or are they able to do that for themselves? Do they know um, what classes they need to take to finish and graduate? And this domain is especially important for young adults who are recovering from psychosis because executive functioning uh, is often affected uh, with conditions like schizophrenia. So, and also the medicines that we use to treat these conditions can also cause side effects that slow folks down. Um, and so working with young adults and helping them succeed academically is an important part of the transition to college process. Another domain that we, we have to think about um, is the psychosocial development and how to help young adults explore their identity and social relationships. Now, this is a normal task of adolescence, is figuring out who you are, what do you want to do, what are you interested in? And as you can imagine, uh, for young adults struggling with psychosis, this is what, um, this is the time when they get, um, when they experience the illness. And this is the time that they're supposed to figure out who they are, and that gets disrupted. So helping them continue to focus on this very normal part of development during the transition is quite important. And another one is anticipate, anticipating challenges that might occur during the transition. So for example, how are they going to handle stigma on campus? Is there stigma on campus? What kind of supports are available there? Um, how are they going to deal with homesickness if they go away? Um, and also looking at things like um, the dorming situation, uh, drugs and alcohol on campus. So anticipating things that might come up um, once they go to college. Slide. And the way we do this is we use... Um, uh, we use assessment tools. And so there is a variety of different assessment tools. So I'm gonna just sh share some resources with you. Uh, this one's called the TRAP. Uh, it is a specialized tool that actually goes through all of the transition domains. It's quite lengthy and I'll probably only do it one time, but it is an example. And it will go through each domain and help the young adult assess like, am I doing this now? And have the parent figure out if they also agree and then come up with ways that they can sort of practice this. Next slide. Um, this is another one um, called the track, um, and it has uh, specifically for health condition uh, knowledge and skills, and also with uh, daily living skills, um, and for for young adults to practice and and to assess: Are am I where I need to be, or do I need to improve um, this particular domain? Next slide. Um, the Jed Foundation is another important resource for colleges, for high schools, for uh, students and families, and it has a lot of resources, just general resources about the transition to college, not necessarily specific to psychosis, um, but it can be a wealth of information. Other resources that I think are quite helpful is, um, this is the New York City um, guide developed by parents for parents. And it again, it also assesses different areas of um, readiness and um, outlines ways that folks can practice this. So for example, if um, someone's struggling with turning in their assignments, there might be some ways that, um, that they're um, that the young adult and the parent might focus on this. So it might be a way of, um, you're gonna keep a notebook and you're gonna mark off the assignments and then the parent's gonna support them um, through this process as well. Um, so this might be really helpful for families to look at what the resources are and to figure out if if they would be useful for them. Got Transition is another um, resource, a federally funded resource for healthcare transition from the pediatric to the adult setting. Next slide. 
So when you're thinking about transition planning, um, schools are often involved in this process as well. So any young adult that has an IEP, transition goals are part of the IEP. But a lot of young adults don't have an IEP. Um, and from those, um, for those young adults, this may be a, a way to think about transition. Um, the key here is to start as early as possible. Um, so we actually recommend starting thinking about transition to college or beyond around age 13 and starting to kind of think about what you might want to be doing, um, working on emotion regulation, uh, thinking about interests, um, and working through those domains. Uh, we also want to prioritize shared decision making. We want this to be a collaborative process where we really figure out what is important to the young adult, what's important to the family, and considering the needs of both. Um, and then there's a lengthy process of exploring post-secondary career interests and goals. And so for a young adult with psychosis, potentially before they experience psychosis, they may have had one idea where they wanted to go, but potentially they might need to reevaluate whether those initial goals really um, align with the needs that they have now in terms of um, whether they need, what kind of supports they need, uh, on campus, off campus. So if somebody might want it to go abroad uh, for college, um, potentially now they might, that may not be the best course of action. And so figuring that out together and planning for it um, is something that might need to be done. So expectations might need to be adjusted, but it doesn't mean you have to give up on your, on your goals and dreams and you can still pursue them uh, while being realistic about where the student is at at the moment. It's really important to clarify the diagnosis and prognosis. And that by that we mean is where are we at with our current goals? Are there short-term goals? Are there long-term goals? And thinking about um, what kind of treatment might need to be continued in college and what are the available resources? And also thinking about patterns of warning signs of when things aren't going well and how to get supports if that does occur. Um, assessing supports is probably one of the most important things to do. Um, and then coming up with an action plan to address the gaps in college readiness, what I was uh, describing before is a different domains, assessing each domain, thinking about is it each domain have specific things that need to be worked on, coming up with a plan, how are you going to work on them and giving those tasks to the young adult and the family. And then the other big one is um, discussing the transfer of care to the adult mental health services, which can be challenging, and also recognizing that there are limited supports on campus, and often treatment for psychosis needs to be an off-campus uh, endeavor. And with that, I am going to hand it off um, to Dr. Hamra. Thank you, Dr. Elberg. Um, all right, so I'm gonna continue with Ethan's case. Um, as um, as he goes through this process of assessing transition readiness. Um, you review transition readiness and planning, and Ethan starts to feel more assured about his transition to college. You, Ethan, and his parents identify some readiness domains to improve, and he spends a few months actively working on his transition readiness. He's grateful for his IEP in school and feels he would benefit from accommodations in college as well. So he starts working with the CEUs, which is the, the Supported Employment and Education Specialist in his Coordinated Specialty Care Program on learning how to qualify and set up his accommodations. All right. So I think it's really important to note the difference between accommodations in high school and accommodations in college. Um, this transition from high school to college is a big one in terms of transitioning to independence for any student. Um, and for someone with psychosis, it just adds another layer of complexity. That's so that's why it's so important to have extra support. Um, IEP and 504 accommodations are really helpful to provide us documentation to colleges in requesting accommodations, but they don't automatically transfer to college. Um, it's something that the student themselves has to request from whatever Office of Accessibility or Disability Services there is on that specific college campus. And then not only does the student need to advocate for themselves with that Office of Disability Services to have accommodations approved, 
um, they typically also have to go to each individual professor to let that professor know that they need these accommodations um, and then the professor carries them out in the class or allows them to, to have those accommodations in the class. So it's a bit more involved for the student in terms of them taking their own advocacy role. Um, and so that's why that domain of transition readiness is really important. Um, with the psychoeducational testing, again, something that's really helpful in getting accommodations approved through colleges, usually the testing has to be done within the past three years, which is a requirement of IEPs. So again, that's why it's useful to have an IEP going into it. Um, the IEP transition goals, um, that's something to work on in high school. Um, these are goals that are geared towards the student's goals for after they graduate, things like making sure they're taking the right classes to be able to get into college, making sure they're doing extracurricular activities that might be helpful and building skills and also building their college application, making sure they're doing things like engaging in social skills groups if that's something that's important. Those are all things that can go into a transition plan. Working with the high school guidance counselor and special education teacher, resources that can be really helpful in high school. Um, and then also on the college side of things, again, get really getting to know the Office of Accessibility or the Office of Disability Services, who that representative is, where the office is, and how you can access them. Next slide. So what are the, some of the things that are really important to consider when you're looking for a college that's a good fit? Because not every college is gonna be a good fit for every student. And just like Dr. Elberg said too, sometimes you have, a student might have goals that they had originally, but then their severe mental illness kind of changes the plan a little bit and you have to reassess those goals and reassess what might be a good fit. Um, so some things to consider, housing options, like um, are there roommates? Are they, can you have individual rooms like on a suite? Um, are there options to live off campus or to live in an individual um, to live in an individual room? Um, so those kinds of things are important to consider and what might be best for that student, um, how many students there are in the college, what the class size is. Um, are, is there an option to do virtual classes or are all the classes in person or are all the classes virtual? Again, what might be a good fit for that? How good is the access to healthcare services? Not just the on-campus services, but also what might be around that school. Um, where is the college? Is it close to home? Is that important? Um, is it in a city? Is it in a rural area? What's the best fit for that student? What's the transportation like? Will the student have to walk to class, take public transportation? Will they be driving? Um, does insurance transfer? Is that something the student will have to think about in going to this college? Um, what is the access to natural supports, people like family around that campus, um, peer supports, and then also to look into school specific accommodations. I mean, some schools have uh, specific programs for students with disabilities and other additional supports that can be really helpful to know about as you make this transition. Next slide. Um, so as you're preparing for this transition to college, again, thinking about mental health care, are we going to have to find a new mental health care services? What is that going to look like? Starting that search as early as possible to make sure you have everything set up before transitioning, um, making sure the student is able to balance treatment along with going to school, thinking about what housing accommodations might, mean, might be needed, and again, the academic accommodations. And on the next slide, I have a list of uh, possible accommodations that might be helpful for a student in college. Things like extended time, using computers, um, speech to text software or text to speech software. Um, sometimes there's peer note takers that can help or um, being able to record lectures. Those kinds of things are, are pretty common accommodations that can be really helpful for students with psychosis. And the take home message here is to start transition planning as early as possible. Make sure to prioritize shared dis decision making and as, as a collaborative process. To talk about the domains of transition with these youth and any other stakeholders. Making sure to really explore colleges and find the ones that fit. And then to help advocate for accommodations in college. 
with that, I'm going to pass it off to Ms. Bethany Boyk. Um, thank you so much. Hello, everyone. So uh, my name again is Bethany, and um, I have lived experience with a form of schizophrenia called schizoaffective disorder, which is a form of schizophrenia with a mood disorder, mine being bipolar disorder. You can switch to the next slide. Before I tell you uh, a little bit about my story and uh, my college experiences, I wanted to read you a poem. This poem expresses what it's like to um, have audio hallucinations and deal with psychosis for the first time. It really shows the emotional toll it takes on a person and gives you a glimpse of kind of what it's like to have that experience. And I wanted to share it with you today. Um, the slide has original artwork on it by myself. It's supposed to be a face. It's called Faces. And the poem is called, Who is Talking to Me? I'm trying to understand the echoes of my mind. Who is talking to me? Who is there? My mind trembles in fear. Am I her? Am I the little girls? of various ages and stages, trapped from far distances, in the closet, under heavy covers, hiding in fear? Or am I grown? Did I become the monsters that haunted me for years? Have I neglected myself? Have I turned inward? Am I folding into compartments like a nesting doll? Am I okay? Am I so many parts of one whole because I'm trying to understand the circumstances that shattered me into pieces? I think so. I am a china plate, shattered on the floor. I am gray skies before the storm. I'm every beautiful mess, trying to figure out how to walk again. I'm crawling every night, trying to reach the phone that has been ringing nonstop. Why are the voices calling me? Leave me a message on the tarot cards I scream. Give me a sign, a clue. Let the lights flicker in the dark. I need to know why you are here. Voices demeaning, demanding, challenging every single second of the action of my being. Tell me who you are. A visitor unannounced. Give me your real name. Give me your identification. I need a clear description of your identity. What is your purpose here? Why are you haunting me? I am speaking to you. I am speaking to you. So you must answer me. Who are you? Next slide. Um, so that poem for me is a cathartic experience that shows, like I said, kind of what it was like to hear voices for the first time. I actually started dealing with symptoms of mental illness very early on in my life. Um, around age seven, I started having panic attacks. I had severe anxiety. Um, I dealt with a lot of traumatic experiences. And uh, I didn't, obviously, I didn't have coping mechanisms um, throughout uh, my childhood and uh, middle school years. I was kind of a bizarre kid. Um, I had a lot of um, odd interests like aliens and witches. I was always into things you couldn't see. Um, I did have some visual hallucinations that were never addressed. Um I dressed in odd clothing that I had made out of different materials and glued pom-poms and glitter and all kinds of wild things to my clothing. Um, got made fun of quite a lot. Um, finally, in high school, about ninth grade, um, I started being very suicidal, lots of suicidal tendencies. Um, my moods were shifting really bad. Um, and I, uh, I was failing a test and uh, to me, failure wasn't an option. I was raised by two addicts and I did not want to fail. My goal in life was to be perfect and I had to be perfect in my head. So I, I did something that was quite unorthodox. I started bashing my, my head against the lab table over and over and over in science class. And the kids just started laughing and yelling for the teacher all different ways because they were like, oh, the crazy girl's finally going crazy. You know, and the teacher was like, oh, she's just being dramatic. 
I wasn't being dramatic. I was literally dying on the inside. They wheeled me down to the guidance office in a wheelchair and called my mother. A knot grew on my head and I just wailed. Um, the principal told my mom that they were going to call Child Protective Services if she didn't seek me out um, psychiatric help. I'd asked her previously for psychiatric services, but she said, no, I was hormonal and all these different things. I think um, a higher power something that, um, you know, my, my principal, um, talked to my mom that day because, um, I, I was not well. Um, the psychiatrist said that I had major depression, insomnia, and anxiety. I was put on three medications that day. And my mother told me I wasn't really mentally ill and that I didn't need these medications, but I took them and I desperately sought help. I, um, I took the medications, but they didn't really work well. And, you know, I, I told my mom I needed to go back. And the next month I told my doctor, you know, I'm still having problems, not sleeping. I'm just not feeling right. I'm hopeless. And so she changed, um, she added another medication and changed one of them. And I, um, had a severe reaction where my kidneys almost shut down and I was in the hospital for seven days. Well, after that, my mom was completely against medication, and um, I completely deteriorated. This is where the psychosis really hit. I remember staying in my grandma's basement that summer, and it was because I was afraid to be upstairs. Going up the stairs to get to the bathroom was the most courageous thing I could do because I was terrified. The voices in my head were telling me that people were spying on me, that if I went by windows, they could hear my thoughts. If I went to check the mail, which my grandma needed me to do, I felt like I could hear people through their cars trying to interrogate me. I was completely gone. Finally, my grandma decided to contact my mom and tell her I, I absolutely needed to get back on medication. I started in a, a regimen and an antipsychotic and um, I was better, but I wasn't Bethany. I was a zombie. And um, being a zombie was not the best because I lost a little part of myself. And I, I did my schoolwork. I did everything I could. You know, I did my AP classes. I, you know, tried so hard because in my heart, I wanted to go to college. I wanted to be successful. I had plans. I had dreams. I wanted to do something special because the people around me never had. So I prepared, I did different things to get into a good school. But the thing is, I had to try different medications. From age 13 to 24, I was on 35 different medications, not including all the combinations to get where I am now. Um, simply, Changing medications means something's not working, and college was very difficult. I got into a great school that was extremely helpful. It had low numbers of students in each class. There were probably 25 or less kids in each class, but, you know, I'm constantly changing medications in the hospital, out of the hospital, going to crisis centers 19 times in four years. It takes a toll. I didn't have any, any family response really, except for my grandma, but she had moved to a faraway location and it was hard to communicate and things were just falling apart. I had a found family though. My friends were my family and they were my support. I did not have an IEP. I did not have support from a lot of resources that I needed. I desperately needed those resources. Um, but finally I, I got counseling at my college. I, I learned that the college had counseling and that helped me quite a bit. And, um, I decided that, um, through the school, I could get disability resources once they diagnosed me with a severe mental illness. And so, um, although it was the incorrect mental illness, it was bipolar for a while. Then finally, later on in my life, schizoaffective, um, I was able to, I was able to get certain services like a note taker, extended time on tests, um, to go into a room alone and take my test. These things very much helped. 
um, something I feel that um, what we needed was to be able to wear headphones. When you are hearing voices, comments on every single second, every single thing that you are possibly doing, telling you you're a horrible person, you are useless, you are unworthy of everything, you are unworthy of love, no one cares about you, and you're in class and you're trying to listen to a lecture and you can't, you can't concentrate. There's no way. You just simply stare. You stare and you stare and you stare. That's what I did. You need these headphones. We need other resources. We need to talk to colleges. We need to talk to schools. Like maybe certain kids need things that other kids, you know, don't. And, you know, um, for me, headphones would have been a very good support because all the other time I wasn't in class, I'd be wearing my headphones. This was before earbuds came out. And um, I, I needed that. Um, you become very desperate for, um, you know, feeling that um, you kind of need, you need something that makes you feel less alone. I wish we had something for severe mental illness in colleges or in my college that we could identify with that was stigma free and anonymous. In my mental health care center for a, um, that I ended up going to eventually after my, um, the college counseling center at my school said, you know, we, we think you might need a little more help. Um, I went to a different agency outside of them and they had a schizophrenia anonymous, um, group. We need schizophrenia anonymous. We need psychosis anonymous. We need something in schools that people are able to go to, to feel less alone. Because from my childhood to the present, I only felt alone. Um, the days that were extremely difficult were the days where you feel like you can't finish your work. You can't do your assignments because of the symptoms. And we need to be able to talk to professors in a, in a way where they don't stigmatize you. I had very amazing professors who were compassionate, who understood, who, you know, were great. But then I had two professors who weren't at all helpful. Uh, one of them asked me what my disability was, and I told them, but then began to say, well, that disability, you know, having this disorder, you know, you wouldn't even be in college. You wouldn't be able to handle college. So I don't really believe what you're saying. I was crushed. Uh, my whole childhood, I was gaslit and manipulated. And that comment from that professor hurt me so profoundly and made me rethink my diagnosis and me as a person. When really that professor was stigmatizing people with mental illness. That should never happen. Another time, um, it was literally the last class I took in college and um, I had to be hospitalized. I had told the professor ahead of time I was not feeling good and that I was going to get help, um, but I was going to do everything I could to get my work done and to pass the class. And, you know, if they needed anything, you know, they could call these numbers and um, I got out of the hospital and I was able to take my test and um, the professor had called the dean of the school making a um, comment saying that I should not be able to pass this class even if I pass the test because I wasn't attending the classes. I understand that, but at the same point, being in the hospital saved my life. If someone had a broken bone and they had to go to the emergency room to get their knee put in place or they had to get some sort of surgery and they were out for a few days, how is that any different from me trying to save my life? So I ended up um, talking to the dean and I told them, you know, what, what happens. And they were very, very um, 
appropriate in their actions. And they said, no, the professor was wrong. I passed the class and I was able to graduate on time with my peers. I'm so thankful for that experience. Um, I want to add that there are tools we can use, um, people who are educators, people who are counselors, different things that you can actually give your students with psychosis, with different mental illnesses that can help them, are things they can carry with them, things they can put in their backpack in a very small pouch, a Ziploc bag, anything small. And these things will help ground them and bring them to reality. When I say ground, I mean take you from being in an alternate space or an ultimate headspace, a different thinking perception, and bring you back to present tense. Where am I right now? Because sometimes hallucinations and delusions make you feel like you're not where you're supposed to be. They can make you feel like, you know, you are being trapped in some jail somewhere, but you're currently in your college desk. So how do I get from jail back to my seat? You have to ground yourself. One, go outside your house, find something that is nature related and that you can keep in your hands or I mean in a bag that you can put in your hand and kind of touch like a rock. This rock is your home. This represents where you live and where you dwell, your dwelling. Rub the rock in your hand. Paint the rock if, I will, if you want to. Write something in Sharpie on it. Put an identification on it and hold it in your hand. This is your center. Okay, so when you are anxious, when you are scared, when you feel like you are out of touch with what is going on, pull that rock out and say, this is my reality. This is real. Touch the rock. This is real. When you dissociate, when you delusion, when you have hallucinations, you need to real you need to find your reality and that rock is your reality. The senses. Now we have the the different senses and these things can also help us. Now touch. Besides the rock, having a piece of fabric like a piece of felt or um, cotton, anything, even a little stuffed animal, anything that you feel comfortable like holding or touching that you're safe with that makes you calm is really important. Get a, get a piece of your old um, pajamas that you are gonna throw away, cut a, cut a corner out of it and touch it. That feeling makes you feel safe. It makes me feel safe, why not do that? That's something you can touch. Something you can taste. Put your favorite candy in a bag and carry it with you. When you are feeling that, you know, you're kind of off, you're having an off day, eat that piece of candy. Enjoy it. Don't just crunch it down. Leave it in your mouth. Let it, let it simmer. Let it, you know, do its thing. And think about the taste. What does it taste like? Think of all the adjectives you can think of to describe it. Now think of things that um, you can hear. Put your favorite song on. You know, grab your headphones with your phone or just grab your phone because pretty much everyone has a phone. And if you don't, you know, go to your um, library, find something, music, radio, anything you can do. Listen to some music. Put on something that makes you feel comfortable. Um, next, um, put something you can smell in your backpack. This might sound a little weird, but it, trust me, it works. Lotion, if it's lightly scented, put it on your hands, rub it in, feel it, smell it, go somewhere nice, go on a vacation, take some coconut lotion, smell it in your hand, go to the beach. If you can't do lotion, if it's, if, if, if you have a classroom where there's no scents involved, go to the bathroom, put your favorite soap in a little bottle, wash your hands, smell your hands. Something I was taught in therapy was that if you feel extremely unwell, either suicidal or very out of touch with reality, splash your water, I mean, splash your face with ice cold water. This can help shock your nervous system and bring you back to kind of like 
um, your center again, like what I was talking about. Again, these are things that affect your senses. These are things you can carry with you that you always have with you that can help. Pictures. Put pictures that are actual pictures, not pictures in your phone. Put some actual fun pictures that you can touch and feel and look at the color and move around that make you happy. Put them in your, put them in your backpack. Just a couple that you can look at that make you smile. Anything that makes you smile. Because happiness is something people shouldn't be able to take away from you. And your pictures remind you what is happy. Happiness. Um, finally, um, in the end, my last suggestion is that besides the pictures, um, put an emergency list in your wallet. This emergency list goes right by your ID. Even put it around your ID. When they're looking through your bag, they can find it. If you have an emergency of any kind, have your medications list on this, on this paper. Have your diagnosis on this paper. Have medications you can't take because you're allergic to them on this paper. Hospital preferences if you have them. Names of people that you trust that can be contacted. And then things that calm you down. Laminate this paper and put it in your wallet. This could save your life. Again, my name is Bethany Boyk. You can read my story, which is out on Amazon and Barnes & Noble. It's called Diary of a Schizophrenic. You can hear my full life story in this book. You can see art that I've made, diary entries, and other poems. Check it out. Thank you for your time. I'm humbled and honored that you have listened to me. Here's some more information. Next slide. These are some social media handles that um, I wanted to just display real quick, and you can look at these later on in the future. Next slide. Bethany, thank you. Thank you so much for your courage, sharing your wisdom with us, your resiliency, and your tools that can support all of us and help us be a better support to many, many other young people. So thank you. Thank you so much for sharing all of this with us. And, and to your point, we all have a lot of work to do in helping other educators do a better job of providing support, you know, to all the young people that we are interfacing with, whether we're working with them in schools or in coordinated specialty care programs or wherever we may be happening to have those interfaces. And thank you for the great suggestions and giving us some guidance on, on how to address loneliness and how to be of a better support. So thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and you can see all the thanks coming to you through the chat as well. Okay. Um, really, really appreciative. And, and to all of our speakers, you know, thank you so much for framing this discussion for us today and, and giving us these recommendations. I, you know, I haven't seen many questions show up in our q and I, I had some I wanted to actually ask, you know, the group and I think, and, and Bethany, as you were sharing your family situation, it raised some of them for me, you know, in some of the discussion, uh, people talk about the importance of shared decision making. We talk about how to help young people prepare for a, a college experience when they may be in high school. But we also know sometimes that not every young person and their family members or guardians have the same perception of where that young person is and what, you know, and, and what really is the next step for them on their learning path. And, and I wonder, you know, in the, in the world we have around informed consent and confidentiality, but also know we're dealing with, with often issues of FERPA versus HIPAA. I wonder mm -hmm. if any of you have some guidance for the people that are here today around how, how one helps a young person and family negotiate some of the complex conversations that we're sort of referencing 
that I think, you know, can really be quite challenging in terms of um, helping, you know, families come together um, around planning for next steps. Is there anyone who could make a few comments to that issue, do you think? Um, I'll, I'll take a stab at it. Um, so I talked a little bit about um, some of the scales, some of the assessment tools, and I often find that that is so concrete for folks to embrace um, that it really helps. So I'll, I'll have like young adults um, come in and they'll say, no, I, I'm, I'm good. I, I'm doing all that. Uh, I'm ready. I say, okay, no problem. But let's, let's, let's look at this tool. And so then they fill it out and then they say, oh, actually, I don't, I don't do that. I, I'm not, I, I might not know how to do that. I, but that does sound important. So maybe I should. And it's sort of the same thing for families too. So sometimes families will underestimate actually how ready their um, their child or their um, the participant might be. Um, and they'll actually say, no, no, they need more help than they need. Um, and then they'll together we'll do those tools and then they'll say, oh, well, actually they are ready. They they are they're already doing this. So it just kind of helps. Um, it takes out the emotions out of it. And and both parties can then um can can then see where they're at. Um, the other thing I like, especially for for younger kids, is ways that families can actually be helpful and sitting down together at the table and say, well, how can mom and dad help? How can this person be helpful? Because sometimes parents, you have you have a young adult who uh, was just hospitalized, and parents sometimes will will hover and actually undermine that recovery. Sometimes, as much as they want to be supportive, will sometimes invalidate that person's attempts towards autonomy. Um, and we want to be helpful. We want that those supports to be there to support that young adult, but we also want that young adult to rally. And to be able to be more autonomous and and kind of move forward in the end towards independence, and to, and I found this a, a, as a way to really sit down at the table and come up with joint goals that both the young adult and the family can work on. So I don't know if anyone else wants to. Um, and just to, thing I'll just oh sorry go ahead oh, go ahead. Um, I just wanted to bring up also that I think a lot of times people. What I have found is people think like, okay, it's either I finish high school and I go to work or I finish high school and I go to a four-year you know, like college university program. And that's not, it doesn't always have to be like one of those two as options. And when families do sometimes disagree on like how ready someone is to go to that kind of like four-year university, it's really good to talk about options like maybe take a couple classes from the community college and see if you can like live a little bit more independently and work on school during that time. And at the same time, you're building college credit to maybe ultimately transfer to, to another college or not. Um, and so like those are, there's a lot of alternate pathways to, to getting a college degree. And I think that's also really important to talk about. Bethany. Hey, I just wanted to comment on trauma-informed care real quick. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people with high A, a scores, so adverse childhood experiences um, in broken families, you know, different situations, they don't have support from mom and dad or caregiver or grandma, grandpa, whatever they're living with. And so they don't even have that as a support at all. And so how do we, you know, how we, how do we help those people? And I think for, in my case, I didn't even know that, you know, I had resources or how mm -hmm. mentally ill I was. No one actually told me how mentally ill I was. I just knew something was terribly wrong with me and I was seeking services. And then um, I think that with um, getting kids ready for college that have these um, adverse events and that, you know, because sometimes trauma can trigger mental illness, um, you know, we need to educate youth that, you know, here's decisions you can make. These are things you can do. It's because it's not just the parents. We, we, the, so many kids can't, you know, some, some kids can't trust their parents or caregivers right. because of, you know, alcoholism, drug addiction, you know, different 
problems and um, in our communities, you know, and I, I feel like that's huge. And if, if you can be an advocate for yourself and you can have like, you know, school, you know, resources that actually say, you know what, I'm going to sit down with you. I'm going to help plan with you for college. I'm going to help. Do you want a job? Do you want this? Do you want that? Let's talk, you know, and we need more of that in high schools and middle schools because we're, you know, we're suffering. These kids are suffering and they have no one at right. all to advocate. Thank you for reminding us of that, Bethany. And, and, you know, I, I see we're sort of about um, a time to stop and, and thank you all for being here. Um, and just, you know, before we quickly close, thank you all again for your wonderful presentations. Eleanor, I saw your questions in the Q&A and we'll try to include some resources for you and the resources that go out in a week. And Jessica, do you want to uh, close us out at this point then? Yes, I'd love to. Well, thank you again, everyone, for being here with us today. It's been a pleasure bringing this session and the overall learning series to all of you. Um, I want to remind everyone that we have a quick survey that we ask you to complete. Um, you will be redirected to the survey when you close the Zoom webinar window. And we'll also be sending the survey link in our follow-up email to everyone who attended today. The information that we compiled through the survey helps us improve the quality of our events in the future and continue to receive funding to put together uh, trainings and events like the one that we held today. And on this slide, um, again, you're going to get a copy of the slides and the recording uh, within a week. And we're also compiling all of the resources that our speakers have shared with us throughout the learning series. We're compiling those into one document and we'll be sharing those with you as well within a week along with the slides and the recording. But please, I invite you to stay connected with us. Um, you can visit our MHTTC website, follow us on social media, subscribe to our newsletter, visit the PEPNET website for additional resources and to learn more about early psychosis work that is being done across the country. A special shout out to our speakers for helping us bring our vision for this session to fruition and for PEPNET and MHTTC colleagues who supported this learning series. Again, thank you for joining us, everyone. Please take care of yourselves and have a lovely rest of your day. Thank you.